say hello and welcome and to let you know that this event is being recorded and that the Cool Institute for Advanced Studies is planning to post it on their website for further researchers in the future. Um, so hello to all, all those of all of you in the future listening to this, watching this. And I will, um, I'd like to begin with uh, a territorial announcement as we, or ter territorial acknowledgement as we do at U of A. Um, and I'm going to speak the words that are developed through the provost office in a broader consultation with the Council on Indigenous Initiatives, town halls, and reviewed by Indigenous faculty and staff. So the University of Alberta respectfully acknowledges that we're located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. So I speak these exact words and to honor the work of those who crafted them, as well as a scholar of performance, I understand the power of repetitive, performative, and authoritative speech acts that can intervene and change the social norms. Um, and I think that that's, this is a, a practice that is beginning to do this. So acknowledging territory is intricately linked to our invitation to Theresa May to speak about the practice of eco-dramaturgy, climate theater, and how these can decolonize, and how these can engage decolonization in the classroom and on stage. So as Natalie's already mentioned in the chat, a prompt to audience members to also drop into the chat where you're joining us from today, the Indigenous territories that you're that you are on and would like to acknowledge. So a little bit about me. I'm a white settler scholar and associate professor at the U of A in the drama department. I research Indigenous theatre, performance, politics, and land and language, as well as the construction of white possession through performance. I am very much in the process of learning how to uh, unbecome a Hunitim or a hungry one uh, in the, the Halkamilan language uh, out on the coast where I'm joining you from today. In Coast Salish people's lands um, and instead become a respectful visitor or somebody who walks alongside. I, since arriving at the University of Alberta in 2016, I've been learning about the wisdom concept of Wakotoan. And uh, so Dwayne Donald, a Papa's Chase Cree education professor, has recently published uh, on the embodied nature of this concept uh, that I think is quite instructive to us and in the world of theater and performance. Um, Building on Ruben Quinn's uh, Nehio uh, teacher's explanation of the morphemes of the word Wakotoan, explains that this wisdom concept emphasizes the yes, they balance between all relations, human and more than human, uh, but it's also created through a combination of the ideas. Um, if you break down the word, it just is describing a, the bent over walking over the land in reciprocal movements that is all uh, grouped together as a concept. And so that actually helps me envision what does it mean to be uh, working and in relation to, to land through that, through that concept. So, um, and it also helps me remember that this work doesn't happen necessarily sitting in a chair reading a text, it's an embodied, embodied practice, which I think Teresa here today will speak about greatly. So just to conclude my remarks in the opening here, I want to thank the Cool Institute for Advanced Studies and my fellow Cool Scholars, some of who are here with us today, um, and uh, how much I've appreciated the work that we've done over the last few years. It's always been, whenever we have a chance to get together, I've always leave inspired uh, for, with uh, new projects and ideas and appreciate so much the relationships we've been building. I always look forward to the times we spend together and hope we can continue that. I would like to thank Casey Germain, uh, the very supportive and patient program coordinator for, for the Cool Institute, and Amy Lee, the research associate who supported this event from the Research Creation and Social Justice Collaboratory. And of course, I also extend my thanks to my fellow members of the drama department who've been very supportive of this work. So this is a part of a series that the Cool Scholars have been organizing uh, in various ways on, on U of A's campus to bring forward the concept of the efforts to understand what does it mean to, uh, what will climate resilience in the 21st century be? <laughs> I guess is one way to say it. So a quick overview of the event. We'll have, uh, after I introduce Teresa, she'll have, she has a, a, a presentation for us that's about 45 minutes long. 
Um, I, we then also have three respondents, uh, Mikere Stuart Herrera, Yelena Glusman, and Jean O'Hara, who will respond uh, af directly after Teresa speaks. So, and I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll hold your introductions, Mikere, Jean, and Yelena, till after Teresa's talk. And then we'll open it up for Q&A uh, with everyone who's joined us here today. <laughs> and so the last thing I want to do is inter inter introduce our very uh, special and honored guest, uh, Teresa, Teresa M. May. Um, Teresa is a professor in theater arts at the University of Oregon, where she received the Thomas F. Herman Distinguished Teaching Award in 2021. She teaches native theater, Latinx dramatic literature, eco theater, as well as devising and performance courses. Her publications include two books, Earth Matters on Stage, Ecology, Environment in American Theater, recently published in 2020. Salmon is Everything, Community-Based Theater in the Klamath Watershed, 2019. She also has an edited volume, Readings and Perfor in Performance and Ecology, in 2014, as well as numerous articles and chapters that bridge performance studies and environmental humanities. She is co-founder of the Earth Matters on Stage Ecodrama Playwrights Festival, and is currently working on a new play in collaboration with Native communities in Oregon. Uh, so thank you all so much. I really look forward to our conversation today. Over to you, Teresa. Thank you, Selena, and thank you, everyone. I'm so I'm so honored to be here. And um, you know, the question right now is, where is here? <laughs> um, and I really appreciate that you're all coming from different places, and we come from different places, both in terms of the indigenous North American land. Um, that we inhabit and that we draw sustenance from, but we come from different places in our own lives, different events, different, I think, you know, this whole period has made so real um, the, the importance of acknowledging the lived experience of everyone. So I just want to acknowledge as I would, you know, in, a, in any classroom that you bring with you the stories and the lived experience that it's going on for you right now. Um, I will share with you that I uh, live with an older dog who is quite um, aging. And so we're in that end of life phase with him. Um, and that's something that's just always in my heart, no matter what. So um, hopefully he won't be whining, um, but he does a lot of whining. Um, I'm going to uh, tell you what we're going to do today or what I'm going to do, what we're going to do, sort of the arc of the conversation. And then I will, um, you know, acknowledge the Kalapuya Ilahi, the traditional homelands of the Kalapuya on which I stand as part of, as part of my talk. But there are, um, there are four parts. Um, the first is, um, I'm just gonna get this, uh, I have to share my screen, right? Um, okay, share screen, yes. I too can do Zoom. <laughs> Where it is, share screen. There we go. Um, the first thing, admit that person. Okay. So, the, um, okay. So, is that showing, Casey? Yeah. Um, yeah, we see you. Uh, great. Thank you. That I want to uh, do and briefly is to lay out this critical framework that I call eco dramaturgy. And in the process of doing that, I'll talk about some um, pretty canonical um, United Statesian American uh, theater um, and, and pieces of plays, pieces of production, um, just so you can get a sense of the um, interrogation that it is, the intervention it tries to be um, as a theoretical lens and a lens for historiography. Um, I know we're a mixed group today. There are, there are people you know, maybe who are primarily scholars or theater uh, historians. There are people who are primarily artists, um, theater makers. Um, I am both, and actually I think all of us probably are both. Um, so, so then the next piece that I wanna talk about, the second piece is to talk about two plays um, that I have directed, but also written about both by Canadians. So um, that'll be exciting. Um, you can catch me up <laughs> in, um, uh, you know, my own, you know, uh, 
perceptions from the South here, right? Um, uh, and talk about them in terms of some of the production challenges that I faced um, as a, as a um, you know, allied settler director. Um, and then uh, I wanna turn to my collaborative work with the regional um, tribal communities that I work with here in Northern California and in Oregon um, and, and just tell you about some of that work. And then we'll um, turn it over to uh, respondents and questions. And then the last thing I wanna do is make sure that if there's anybody who's here today who's gonna come to the workshop on uh, Monday, that I leave with some sense of how you'd like to spend that time, what would best serve you. So I, um, I stand today on Kalapuya Ilahi, which is the sovereign traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya people. They were dispossessed and forcibly removed from their land by the United States government between 1851 and 1855. And I honor this land and I take inspiration and nourishment from this land. And I claim this land for the Kalapuya and I claim reparations and return of lands for all indigenous people of North America. The Kalapuya people are now um, members of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. Those are two of nine federally recognized tribes in the state of Oregon. Um, there were over, uh, there are over uh, 50 um, tribal identities, um, language groups, um, but nine federally recognized tribes. So there are many of the, the um, people who um, were members of tribes that are not recognized by the federal government have come together in these, in these um, confederations. You're seeing two pictures of two places I love. On the left is the Willamette, the Willamette River, which was a traditional fishing um, and, and transport uh, river for the Kalapuya. And the other um, is an area that is a conservation land trust uh, area out at um, a county park that we call Mount Pisgah, um, but also a place where uh, camas grows, which is one of the first foods of the Kalapuya, and very beautiful blue flower in the springtime. So to turn now just to this, um, uh, you know, theoretical framework and to just lay down uh, some of that, that some of that fr framework, um, it, ecodramaturgy um, really has three kind of uh, tracks or three aims. The first is, is scholarly, historiographic, uh, theoretical, analytical to examine the implicit environmental message of any play of production um, to expose the ecological ideology uh, through scholarship, through historiography, um, including the ecological violence of settler colonialism, um, including ongoing patterns of, of colonialism. Um, the second eco-dramaturgical project uh, is to actually use theater as a methodology of inquiry. It's embodied, it's communal, it's immediate. So these become really important uh, tools to use to grapple with contemporary um, environmental challenges, environmental justice, climate justice, and et cetera. So it's really the theater making aspect of eco-dramaturgy. And then the last um, is, pays attention more to the material practice of theater. This is a material art, we use stuff, we have a carbon footprint, um, and how do we take responsibility for that, for that footprint, for that impact, for that use of resources and materials. Um, so that's a whole, you could call, that's called often green sonography or, um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, your um, University of Toronto at York has an MFA program in um, 
and green sonography. Uh, my colleague Ian Garrett is there. So that's a whole track as well um, of application of this, of this framework, um, which I did not invent, by the way. Um, I, I sort of coined the term, whatever that means, but there are a whole uh, group of scholars, both Canadian and United Statesian, who have been part of this articulation of theater has to respond, you know, uh, to um, our relatedness to the natural world. So um, just to kind of demonstrate this as a theoretical lens, as a historiographic lens, um, I'm going to talk about um, a couple uh, United States in um, plays, three or four that you may be familiar with. Um, probably you're not familiar with Augustin Daly's Horizon, which was played in 19, 1871, uh, but was a very, very famous play, um, played on Broadway for, uh, for many, many weeks. Um, and it becomes this, when you look at it through an eco-dramaturgical lens, it, it becomes the fictional and imaginative um, justification for uh, genocide and ecological violence of settler colonialism. And all these tropes, these little images that become so ubiquitous, particularly in, um, in the United States um, imaginary, um, you can't turn anywhere without someone saying, oh, saddle up or or, you know, let's, let's get together and powwow. I mean, just, you know, it's, it's ubiquitous in the way uh, uh, United States as a settler nation expresses itself, at least um, uh, certain elements of the population. So, so it's been a dominant narrative. So one of the things that the dramaturgy has to do is to unpack these narratives, to call them out for, the, the, the racist, the genocidal, um, anti-environmental uh, um, messages that they carry and the way that has informed and shaped and expresses um, uh, 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 white supremacy uh, today. Um, and one might ask why do that since those plays are old and nobody produces them anymore. Nobody's gonna do, you know, that Augustin Daly's play. <laughs> it's an extraordinarily racist play. Um, and yet we have on Broadway musicals such as Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson, which was uh, very popular uh, in 2010, it was produced. And um, it, is, it is a sort of pop punk musical um, extravaganza that puts Andrew Jackson, who was responsible for the Indian Removal Act of 1830 um, and what we call the Trail of Tears or the Many Trails of Tears um, in the United States of which native peoples, indigenous peoples were removed from their homelands um, by the United States government forcibly removed and um, many, many, many people died. Uh, and so this musical uh, is just like riffs on that and becomes this rock musical. And it was protested across the United States. Rihanna Yazi, um, artistic director of the New Native Theater in Minneapolis, led a whole resistance there in Minneapolis to shut it down. Um, so the reason that as theorists and as scholars, we have to keep identifying these, um, you know, the ecological, the ongoing ecological violence, the ongoing uh, colonialism, and white supremacy is because it's ongoing, right? It's like, there it is. So, um, so that's why. And you, I'm sure, can think of plays, Canadian plays that also, although the mythos is not uh, precisely the same, um, it carries a similar intent um, to tell a story that justifies land taking. Right? And so, um, you know, I'm sure you can think of some early Canadian plays that um, could be unpacked in that way. Um, the other thing the plays are doing at this time in the early 20th century is um, masking and romanticizing extractive culture, extractive capitalism, and the whole uh, culture, I mean, the industrialization of the United States at that time is based on um, 
extraction. So there were many plays that celebrated that, plays about miners, plays about timber workers. During the 1930s, um, during the depression, the Great Depression worldwide, depression and the Dust Bowl, which you know, included Alberta, um, from the, the Midwest of the United States up into Canada, into the prairies. Um, there, uh, the Federal um, Theater Project produced a number of plays that were specifically for the purpose of touting uh, large public works pro projects, um, building of dams, damming rivers, uh, uh, creating public power. And these plays, interestingly, um, this, the whole sort of genre out of which they come and the milieu out of which they come is very left, politically left, very progressive, very, um, you know, almost a third of the population were either socialist or communist at the time. Many of the people who were working in the Federal Theater Project were, um, if not members of the Communist Party, they were, they were um, socialist leaning. And um, so what we would now call the left. Um, but uh, these plays were nevertheless um, on the side of extractive capitalism and celebrating that the land as worker and the, the um, use of rivers for um, power and industrialization and ignoring um, and, and not from, um, you know, a value of, of relation, of relationship. Um, so they're really, they're very interesting to look at um, in that way. And I'm, I'm not sure if there are similar plays in Canada that were in a sense dog and pony shows for government projects, um, but there may have been. Um, some of you might be familiar with um, this very famous musical, Oklahoma. Um, hold on, I'm gonna just move my thing there. Oh, someone, admit someone. So, um, so after World War II, um, there is a kind of patriotic uh, backlash in the United States. And there's a return to many of those early frontier stories. Um, and this musical uh, started during the war and then it played after the war, then it became a film most recently in what was it like 2010 or something um, the United Kingdom made a big did a remount of it and then they made a film uh, starring Hugh, Hugh, Hugh Jackman um, in none of these cases did anyone call out the deep-seated um, entitlement to land for white people that this play um, proselytizes really. Um, what's fascinating is that it was based on a play, Green Grow the Lilacs, written by, um, uh, by Lynn Riggs, who is a Cherokee playwright, who was very concerned with Cherokee nationalism. Um, and he was writing when he wrote that play about a very diverse culture. It included um, uh, former slaves, Black Americans, Cherokees, all kinds of, uh, um, um, tribal members who had come to Oklahoma um, during the 1830s and 40s. And so he's writing about a very diverse uh, uh, place, a diverse community, also a very, um, Oklahoma was also a uh, very strong center for the American Communist Party and the wobbly movement. And so this musical interestingly kind of whitewashes over all of that. It says like, no, Oklahoma is really America in a microcosm. So it becomes this stand in for the United States as a, a very patriotic expression of uh, the entitlement to land on the part of this heterosexual couple. So it forwards uh, those values as well um, as many soldiers, uh, service personnel are returning um, and and at the same time that this musical is touring the United States and touring the world, tribes are being dispossessed of their land again because there are service personnel coming home from the war 
There's a great movement west, again, a, a resettling, another wave of settlement moving west and land taking is going on through the Termination Act that many states as well as the federal government uh, in the 1950s started terminating tribes. Um, and that opened up more land for settlement and for resource extraction. So, you know, eco-dramaturgy says eh, that has to be called out, that has to be made visible. Um, Okay, come on forward. There we go. Um, so then just to move forward in time again, the fascinating thing when you, when you turn in a sense, the light of eco-critical, the eco-critical lens, eco-dramaturgy on plays that were written during the civil rights movement, there's a way in which many of these plays um, make a claim to homeland, make a claim to the centrality of embodied experience, make a claim to um, the right to health, um, that, that the living conditions, the, the, the poverty that, has, uh, that is the product of white supremacy ongoing um, has been impactful on people's bodies, on their health, on their families. Um, and so these plays very before, before the um, Environmental Justice Summit of 1990 are making those same claims that the environmental justice movement then makes in, in 1990 to the right to live and work and play and worship in environments that are healthy, that are nurturing, that are supportive, um, physically, spiritually, emotionally. For, um, for families. And so, so you know, you, could, you can look at plays like Raisin in the Sun or Heroes and Saints, and these are very much plays about environmental justice through this lens, um, even though um, Raisin in the Sun would never have been couched as an eco-drama, um, you know, when it came out or even um, 10 years ago. So, um, I mean, this play, Raisin in the Sun, as well as Heroes and Saints, it makes this connection that so many writers are making now between land and labor, right? Between the impact of extraction on not just the land, but on the bodies and the lives of, of people, of families. Um, I'm going to catch up my notes here for just a minute. So I want to turn now to, um, you know, these two plays that um, by Canadian playwrights that um, deal more directly with environmental justice, with um, climate change as a, you know, as a focus. Um, Linda Tehiwe Smith, Maori scholar, says that scholarship is not enough, research is not enough, theory is not enough. None of that keeps people from dying. And that is a, um, in her book called The Indigenous Methodology, she begins to articulate um, why that is so and the extent to which research and scholarship and what I just did has its limits. Um, that it's important, it's important to name um, the ecological violence that arises out of ideologies uh, that value extraction and white supremacy. However, it doesn't keep people from dying um, and we have to do more. And as storytellers, as culture makers, there's an opportunity, I think, because theater is a different way of knowing. It's a way of knowing more akin to our own everyday lived experience more akin to the stories that our elders tell. Um, and so this section, I wanna talk about these two plays in that light as active and engaged and embodied expressions of what Tehue Smith calls 25 indigenizing projects, the end of her book. It's, uh, 
sort of a, a fabulous um, um, list of those things we can be doing, telling stories from women's point of view, um, uh, creating ceremony, bringing community together, um, uh, calling attention to the relatedness and the kinship between land and, and life and land and people. Um, and it's a, a quite a profound list, all of which, in my opinion, are tasks or projects that theater might take up. And certainly Marie Clements does in um, her play, um, Burning Vision. Um, Diane Glantz, a Cherokee playwright, says that plays connect to some kind of power source. It's, she likens it to a new oral tradition because breath is returned to the words. In performance, breath is returned, voices speaking outward from a core of experiences and then making that story part of a larger story. And if there's anything that Clements is doing in this play, which many of you may be familiar, um, familiar with, um, Clements does. Uh, Burning Vision um, takes place in the, um, the Great Bear Lake in the Northern Canadian Territories and um, looks at its transnational, transcontinental impact on lives and land from the discovery of uranium on Diné land um, to the making of the atomic bomb and the detonation of the atomic bomb um, over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And she says, um, so this is just a, um, you, you're more familiar with this geography than my students, but when I teach this play, I really make them look at the geography and the, um, the geography of the North that they're not familiar with. But Marie Clements talks about wanting to tell this story about her family's genetic connection to the history of the land, to the running of uranium, um, and how one person's decision, one person's action, or in the case, to the Labine brothers who founded um, uh, what becomes El Dorado Mine uh, up there in Port Radium, um, impacts not only them, not only their family, but the entire world. Um, and that is the circles of impact that she's trying to um, lay bare and make real um, in this play. And so she tracks this route of the uranium from the mining through the shipping, through the, 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 the Diné ore carriers, um, all the way down to um, Ontario and then to into the refineries uh, in the United States and ultimately to the Manhattan Project. And in doing so, I mean, she does, that's interesting. We think often of a, uh, if we go back to Aristotle of a play, you know, having this arc that is chronological or this arc that is cause and effect um, where we move through time. Oh, what happens next? What happens next? There's no what happens next in this play. It all takes place in a single moment. The moment when um, a family in, in Hiroshima, a fisherman and his grandmother, a moment when or carriers, um, uh, bread makers, Diné community members were brought together in this moment of impact. So it begins and ends with the bomb uh, itself. Um, and what she's doing then with this play is breaking that Western Aristotelian tradition of theater making and play conceptualization um, and instead invoking what Paula Gunn Allen calls a tribal concept of time that is timelessness, an A chronology um, in which both space and time are multidimensional. And in this way, presencing on stage an indigenous perspective that is also consistent with the theories of relativity um, of contemporary physics that gave rise to the bomb, of course, itself. And I think of this counter geography, enormously powerful because it challenges 
how we remember and remaps how we remember and whom we remember and attempts to give flesh to those far reaching impacts of human action and make us more sensitive to the trans temporal and transnational and the previously invisible relationships by making them explicit and making them um, uh, presenced on stage in human, um, in human form and human bodies. Um, it, the place title actually refers, and many of you may know this, to a prophecy uh, by a Diné medicine man in the 1880s who had a dream in which he foresaw the atomic bomb and the, and the plane um, and its effect on people in a faraway place. And then it was in 1999 that a, a delegation of Diné went to Hiroshima and saw and met and talked with community members there. Um, so in a sense, the play also marks that moment, um, a moment when the indigenous people of the Northern Territories went and saw with their own eyes that their stories were the truth, that their stories were powerful and it was in I think it was 1990, it was 98 when they went, then it was 99 when the Canadian Supreme Court, hope I'm getting my dates right because I'm not very good at dates, but, but the delegation went and then it was after that that the, the um, uh, Canadian Supreme Court began to recognize oral tradition as tantamount to history, uh, that if there's an oral record that becomes a historical record and is valid in court. Um, so in this play, she brings together characters from all those worlds, um, and then also other worlds, the world of radio, the world of, of the imagination. She, the, the uranium itself is embodied um, as a child. It's written in four movements, so it moves in a circle um, rather than moving uh, chronologically, as I said, and it in that way becomes a ceremonial expression. And in the production that we did, I mean, I think I think you'd be hard pressed to not direct it in the round. Um, but the actors all also bared witness to the entire story. Um, and then they moved in and out of the action, um, as was um, necessary, but it becomes then a, a, a bearing witness. Um, and it's this ceremonial aspect is in the script um, that, she, that she creates. And at the center of, as all these stories begin to interact, you know, indigenous experience at the center. And one character in particular is the character of the widow of a Diné or carrier. And it's a very interesting um, moment when she's speaking about her um, husband and talking about his, the artifacts of his, of his life, his boots, his, his caribou skin jacket that she made for him and how much he loved these objects. And in our research, my understanding of, of Diné tradition is that the possessions of someone is burned after they pass so that then they can um, go on their journey. So here she is, Clements creates this widow of the Diné or carrier who refuses, who refuses to let go. And there's a way in which that refusal is not a denial of his, of his death, of the, of the loss, but is a refusal of forgetting and is a demand that the audience and that the larger culture remember um, and, re, uh, and take responsibility for that loss. Um, so she's a very, very powerful um, character. Another character that is at the center of the play is um, uh, Rose, who is uh, Métis. And she is a young woman who makes bread. And she makes bread throughout the play, um, according to the recipe of her mother, and she recounts the recipe. 
flour, salt, water, and it continues to recount the recipe as she continues to make bread throughout the play. And so you get this, this um, that which it sustains us, sustains people, food, um, being something that is woven together and ultimately woven together with the dust from the bags of ore, the bags of uranium ore. Um, and then Koji is a character from Japan who literally at the moment of the atomic bomb falls into the water and falls through, comes out as a trout in Great Bear Lake. And upon reading this, you might think, oh, well, this is, would be really hard to theatricalize, right? But Clements is here also drawing on um, a Diné legend of a fisherman who loses a trout in the water and dives in after it. And then, discovers there the great heart of the world. And so it's a very um, rooted in the oral traditions of the Diné and of her own, as she says, her lineage um, in that land and makes of those oral traditions embodied and real on stage. And so in this way, the play accomplishes what Leanne Howe, a Choctaw um, playwright, calls tribalography. Sorry, that wise cut off there. Um, but for Leanne Howe, tribalography is the capacity of stories to create people, to create tribes, to author the future, to say, this is how it will be. And this is who we are. And that's, excuse me, one of the great powers of, of theater and stories in going into climate change. Um, Kyle Powers White um, talks about um, the, all the apocalyptic stories, you know, the sort of futurist um, sci fi apocalyptic stories and says, you know what, um, tribal people, native people, indigenous people already lived through the apocalypse. <laughs> We're not interested in your apocalypse. We're interested in generating a future um, through our stories, through a reassertion of our values, through a reassertion of kinship with land and with one another. Um, and that's, that to me is my understanding of, of Leanne Howe's concept of tribalography and the power of theater, not just to uh, uh, recount the events of climate change or the events of catastrophe, but to carve a pathway through them and a pathway to kinship and relationality. And so in this play, this is what, she, what Clements accomplishes, that there are now these people who were alone, isolated in this, in this moment of horror, um, in a sense, in the space, in the hyperspace, the hyperreality, the, the liminal space of the stage become a community and become one another's keepers. Um, so just now to move to the second, um, this is always very strange on Zoom, I would just have to say this. You know, in a, if we were in an actual room, I'd be able to look in your faces and see like, oh, am I putting that person to sleep or is that person pissed off? And so it's <laughs> and so like talking into the ethers. I know you have all had that experience. And so I just want to acknowledge it because it is present for me right now. Um, so I look forward to our, our conversation about, about all of this uh, in a moment. Um, so Sila by Chantal Bellado, she's Quebec. Quebecois playwright residing in New York. And um, this is the first play of her series, The Arctic Cycle. It deals with three families or three community groups um, on Baffin Island in Nunavut, Canada. And one of the accomplishments of the play, I think, which when I teach it, I, I use, um, 
is to call it, it calls attention to the extent to which living, for example, in Oregon, I am oriented on this north-south axis, right? And most of, many of us, or I would say all of us in the lower 48 are, that may not be true um, for you, but um, certainly this is a play that adjusts that axis and says, no, um, actually let's think of the world differently. Let's think about the relatedness and the relationships that are um, envisaged in the Arctic cycle, in the Arctic circle. Um, so it interweaves three stories, three communities. One, um, there's a couple of Anglophone uh, uh, Coast Guard uh, workers and scientists. There is an Inuit family a community and there's a polar bear family. And these stories are woven together into a play that becomes a braid that moves back and forth between these stories um, as they begin to, um, to meet one another. The two central characters in the Inuit uh, family, Veronica and um, her mother, Liana, are based on uh, Canadian women, um, leaders in their field, incredible voices of power for uh, their communities and um, with regards to climate change and indigenous rights. Sheila Watt Clotier and Tanya Takak. I um, typically, if I teach this play, we spend a lot of time listening to them and who are these women and why did Chantal choose them as models for her characters? But I know that you all are familiar with their work. So I um, will move on, but I just wanna honor their um, legacy and contribution to the imagination of this play. Um, and the play then pits the global international concerns of Liana, based on Sheila Watt Clotier, um, against or in conflict with her daughter, who is a school teacher, who is a spoken word poet, um, and all this against the backdrop of global climate change politics in which the very waters that they are dependent on and the uh, economy of the village um, are engaged with, you know, should it be opened up to shipping, not what happens. Um, so all of that uh, oil drilling extraction of, of resources, what this question, what is gonna happen when the ice melts? Um, the polar bear characters, I just want to spend a little bit of time on this because it, I think it looms large for theater practitioners as we engage with climate justice topics or environmental justice topics. How do we portray on stage kinship and autonomy and beingness of non-human others, especially when probably they're gonna be played by human beings, you know? So it becomes, how do we not just make this something like, a, you know, a ecological minstrelsy in which human beings are, you know, anthropomorphizing? Or is that even possible? You know, it's a huge question in this play because there are polar bears that speak, um, that are present on stage and how are they, how are they to be enacted? How are they to be embodied? Um, so CELA premiered at the Underground Railway Theater in Boston in 2014, and I um, went to see it. Um, this is the polar bear mother that was in that production, a large puppet that was manipulated by the actress playing Veronica. So there was a kind of doubling there. When we produced it at the University of Oregon, I um, one of the things that I wanted to accomplish was, which I didn't think the Boston production did, was to show the extent to which the land is alive. The land is a living environment, a kind of character. Um, and to center those values of interconnection and kinship and the dynamic relationship between land and lives. So um, we had a set that moved and it was moved by um, a chorus of actor bodies that that went in and out of becoming um, still. 
Sila also centers uh, indigenous traditional ecological knowledge in the character of, of Kuvagigai or Tulaguk, uh, as his name was changed later in, in the development of a play, um, played by a native elder in our community. Um, and this character really becomes the person in addition to Liana and Veronica, the person that, that argues for a traditional Inuit um, position and the importance of stories. So circling back to the problem of the bears, you know, are we just dressing up as bears? Are we just gonna have a big puppet? And, and what's the listening out there already about polar bears? Well, they have become this megafauna symbol of climate change. So is there a way we can resist that? Or if we are invoking it, are we invoking it in a responsible way? And what does that even mean? And so the first thing that we have to admit and we have to be aware of is the extent to which the polar bear already lives in the imagination of all the audience members who might come to see our show, or at least most of them. There is the Coca-Cola bear, there is Nanook of the North, there are ways in which the polar bear has been linked to um, negative and racist stereotypes, um, but also ways in which as an extraordinary creature in a beautiful place, it has become the site of, of grief, of you know, almost a kind of generalization of climate change loss. So we wanted to resist all of that. wanted the polar bear uh, to be understood through the Inuit cultural framework in which the bear is kin. And indeed that's how Bilodeau sets the bear in the play um, as, it's not, this is not just anybody's polar bear. This is the polar bear that is deeply embedded in kinship with the stories and the life ways of the Inuit characters and the Inuit uh, people who are represented through stories um, in the play. So that's where we wanted to go. Um, this is a sculpture, which I remember, which I saw many years ago in the Museum of Natural History in Vancouver, BC. And I apologize that I do not have the name of the artist here. But when I saw this again, I thought this is, this is the inspiration for how we might think about the bear or the task of representing the polar bear in this play, that this bear is a village, that this bear is a set of relations, that this, these bears are, um, that they carry the stories of kinship. And so this became a, a kind of visual inspiration for us as we began to engage physically with, not with let's, pretend to be a bear, but just what are the questions that we have about the polar bear? What, is, what are the questions about, about loss, about motherhood, about hunger, um, about fear, threat? And we began to use a kind of contact improv um, method uh, in which all we did was move and explore those questions, not verbally, but just through the body. And at the same time, we looked to Inuit sculptures and all we did was create this, this um, uh, head of the bear. Um, and then the body was the village, was the community and it moved and it changed and it breathed together. And all of this also inspired by um, an animal critical animal studies um, theorist, philosopher, Matthew Clarko, who suggested that there is no such thing as the animal. But what we encounter is this thing we call animals and it produces a kind of space, in our case, a theatrical space, but a space, a clearing for the event of what we call animals. Animals are thing, animals happen. They're not objects, they're events in his perspective. 
And he says, any genuine encounter with what we call animals will occur only from within the space of surrender. And so in that way, we never answered the questions that we asked about the bears, about the character bear, the bear characters. We only continue to ask the question, how is it to be hungry? How is it to be threatened? How is it to, to um, have the ice melt? How is it? How does that feel? How does that feel? How does that feel? Um, and then moving with our own bodies, our own flesh, which is the thing we have in common with the bear, right? Flesh, blood, fur, uh, 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 hunger, terror. These are things we actually do have in common with non-human animals. And so those were the, the experiences we wanted to open up through the portrayal of, of these characters. I should have said this earlier, but you probably all know this already, that the word sila is an Inuit, a Nukhnitu word, um, and is roughly translated as all life is breath, from the original and eternal breath from which creation is drawn to the world itself, sila wraps itself around us, sila moves in and out of our lungs with each breath, sila reminds us that we are never alone. These are spoken by the mother bear um, in the play. And though this play uh, ends with a number of tragedies, losses, and I don't know about you, but I, I can't quite see uh, the climate change era that we're entering to be filled not with loss. There will be loss. It will be huge. It is huge already. But as Donna Haraway has written, the task is to stay with the trouble. The task, like we were engaging with the bears, to stay with the question. How can we, how can we hold to our stories and have and and, and, and actualize those values? How can we uh, continue to respect one another? How can we nourish democracy? Um, how can we decolonize our artistic practice, our teaching, our uh, land on which we live? What little ways each day can we meet the problem with an open heart? Well, I love this quote by Monique Mojica. Um, our bodies are our books, they are our libraries, full of memory and endless resources. And in, in this way, it was this quote that really informed our, our engagement with this play. Um, and in my mind, demonstrates kind of the use of theater at this time. Um, that that it not only matters what stories we tell, it matters uh, because we engage our bodies in those stories. Um, so now to wrap up with this last piece, I just wanna talk a little bit about this project um, called Salmon is Everything. It was in um, 2002, in 2001, there was a big drought in uh, the Western United States and, and particularly in this area of Oregon and California. Um, I don't know how familiar you all are with the geography here, but this is, you can see here, um, Vancouver Island in Vancouver, BC. So we're just about <laughs> um, eight hour drive south. And that's where the Klamath watershed is and it is the watershed in which I taught at the time at Humboldt State University in 2001, 2002. And it is one of the great uh, salmon bearing rivers of the United States and of the West. Um, unlike the Sacramento River and unlike the Fraser River of BC, this river does not have a large metropolitan port at its mouth. Uh, so it is in some ways still pristine. There are a number of dams on the river, 
uh, built in, in the early 20th century um, and in, 2000, um, in 2002, uh, there was a large fish kill on the lower Klamath River. The headwaters are up in the uh, Crater Lake area. They are the homelands um, of the Klamath and the Modoc and the Yahuskin people, traditional homelands of the Klamath Modoc. Um, the Klamath Modoc tribe is still uh, operative there. Then the middle of the Klamath as it moves down to the Siski Mountains is the traditional homelands of the Karuk people, subsistence um, fisheries, and the Hoopa Valley tribe. Um, so you have indigenous tribes and indigenous land all the way along this river. Um, and then at the mouth of the river is the land of both the Tekelma and the um, Yurok. Um, tribal headquarters and tribal lands are here and ceremonial grounds all up and down the river as well. So um, this is um, uh, Ron Reed is a cultural biologist for the Karuk tribe and was one of the uh, collaborators on the project that I did. Um, but they are a very active tribe in protesting the effects of the dams on the river. In the upper Klamath, in the very, you know, in the Oregon area, you see this lake here, you can see Crater Lake here, and then this big lake here is really a wetlands. Uh, it's called Klamath Lake. Um, and this was the Klamath Indian Reservation prior to termination. Um, so there, that land mass was quite large. Now it is quite small. But that land mass in 1902 was opened up for settlement. Um, for agriculture. And so in that area of Oregon, you have um, essentially big ag, uh, industrial agriculture. And that's when the river began to be dammed for the purpose of supplying water to the farmers, um, farmers of potatoes, of alfalfa, of a lot of water demanding crops. As a result uh, of a drought in 2001, uh, those farmers sequestered water. Um, there was a lot of po more politics involved than, than I have time to explain here, but the result was a massive fish kill. Um, over 60,000 fish in the course of a couple of weeks dying on the banks of the lower Klamath River. If you remember that wide mouth I showed you with the sandbar. Oh, there it is, yeah, down here. Just imagine this for three miles filled with the bodies of salmon. So for the indigenous people of the Klamath River, this was a devastating event. It was not just an event of loss of resources and loss of subsistence food, food sources, um, but it was a loss of relatives. Right? It was a loss of family, it was a loss of tradition, it was a spiritual loss. So when that happened, I went to a colleague of mine in the Indigenous Studies program at Humboldt State, um, then called the Teacher Education Program, a uh, scholar named Sue Bursell, and um, said, what if we do a play? Because what was happening was in the national media, the farmers and the ranchers were getting a lot of press, um, but the impact of the drought and the fish kill on the, on the tribes was not getting a lot of press. And people were also heartbroken and they were grieving and they were doing a lot of cleanup. And so she said, well, nothing else is helping us, so maybe, okay. Um, and she writes about it uh, in our book as, as the, the odd moment when this curly brown haired white lady came in and said, do you wanna do some theater? Um, never thinking she would ever do theater. Um, so we put together a group of students that then uh, did research um, into what had happened, did interviews, did a lot of creative writing, and ultimately a script came out of that that we performed for the community um, at, um, in, in Humboldt. And uh, 
I happen to know that um, Jean O'Hara was um, actually my co-director on this project because I was the playwright and really wanted to have a, a, another eye and, and they were a great asset um, to the success of this, this production. They'll talk more about that for uh, later, but um, I'm not being aware of time here. So then we uh, produced it again in 2011 at the University of Oregon, this time with a lot more theatricality because we had a larger budget. Um, and this is where um, I met uh, Von Ron and um, uh, Chinook Cree elder Marta Lou Clifford, who is now my primary uh, research and creative partner. She played the role of Rose, which was originated by Kathy McCove, who's a uh, Karuk Elder, um, who worked on the project originally. So in a project like this, of course, first, the commitment of Native actors and Native roles. But beyond that, the importance of tribal consultation, of getting, we had a a Klamath elder who was consulted on the set, on the costumes, um, and making those relationships centered to the production process. I think in the theater, you know, the show must go on. And we, so we often are driven by a lack of, or it may perhaps sometimes there's a disregard for relationships, but in a, a production such as this, they have to be at the center and it takes more time uh, to do that. And then the whole idea of giving back of how is this piece of theater a gift? And when we performed it at Humboldt State, people came down the mountain to see it that had never been on campus, that had never seen a play. And so in a way it became um, a gift to that community. And then after I, um, took the job at the University of Oregon, Jean took the play with different actors in different parts of the play actually up the river and really gave it back um, in different ways, performing in high schools and community centers and in grandmother's living rooms. Um, so that's always the end product of a project like this, is how does it give back? This is a play that has kept giving back. We've done numerous, numerous readings um, for communities, for tribal communities, um, non-tribal communities at conferences, um, schools. It's a play that gets used. Um, and it, none of that is anything I ever imagined, but it it's, has seemed to have a life of its own. And I think part of the life that it has goes back to this role of theater in the era of climate change. The theater is democracy in action. I mean, think about it. We're in this highly polarized, bubble dominant world. Where else do you have to be willing to set your own views, your own precious political opinions, your own lived experience even, to just set that aside and for an hour or a couple of hours, to entertain conjecture of a time that is somebody else's lived experience, that is somebody else's um, story. And, and just in that way, it's sort of like going to the democracy gym, you know, we have to suspend our disbelief and our judgments of other people. And so theater then has this capacity, I think, to be a space of civic generosity where we can find again, tolerance and understanding and empathy and a willingness to listen to each other's stories and to grant that someone else's lived experience may not be mine and yet it is valid. And, and to grant a character validity is to do just that, right? So um, in this community-based um, work that I've done ongoingly now with Marta Lou Clifford who working on a new play, there's always these these questions that I hold, uh, particularly as a settler descendant, allied, um, non-native theater maker working in consultation, history is always present. It's, you know, there's just, we're never like, 
aren't we over that? Didn't that happen in the past? No, it's always present. Um, the question is whose story is it? Is it mine? I'm the playwright. I want to write it, right? So this question of who does who is the story belong to? Who does it belong to in process? And who does it belong to after? Um, the whole issue of you know digital archiving and copywriting and all that kind of thing um, in terms of oral traditions is a complicated one. Who's being represented? Um, uh, you know, again, who owns the story after it's after it's produced or published? And what's the role of the community in the creative process? And that I think is a, is where community-based theater gets its name is the community is more ongoingly consulting with them throughout the process. So there's a reading and there's a talk back and there's another reading, there's another talk back. And there's a constant, constant reciprocity between the community and the artistic team. I always love to end with this uh, quote by Monique Mojica. Some of you may know her work. Um, in the theater, we are performing possible worlds into being. By embodying that wholeness on stage, we can transform the stories that we tell ourselves and project into the world that which is not broken, that which can be sustained, not only for Aboriginal people, but for all people of this small green planet. It's such an eloquent expression of the possibility that theater is to carve out a future that is just and that is sustainable. Um, I'm just throwing these up here. Um, these are from, um, you'll get a link to a handout for Monday. Some of these questions to ask ask a play or to ask a production. Um, and they're ones I've just been, just been dealing with, but there's the handout goes over them in more detail. Um, this is the end of my talk. So I will now escape and, oh, I have to stop sharing, don't I? <laughs> there we go. Thank you all for listening. And I hope I didn't, oh gosh. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, my that icon. Um, thank you so, so much, Teresa. You've, you've just covered such a huge breadth of work, and I can't wait to jump into our conversation. So I'm going to start that by just introducing our three respondents. I'll introduce them in the order that they'll respond, but I will introduce everybody right away so we can just jump into the conversation. Well, so we'll begin with uh, Dr. McKerry Stuart Hargria. He's a professor in education policy studies in the department here at U of A, in, uh, in, uh, here at U of A, and a former convener of the Intersections of Sustainable, Sustainability Collaborative Research Network for Water Governance, Climate Change, and the Future of Communities. I was initially drawn to McKerry's work on sustainability and climate change as a theater scholar because of her emphasis on how Indigenous ceremony, Maori ceremony, Dance, prayer, singing, and the politics of refusal are core to reconnecting and holding space for resurgent movements that protect lands and waters. McKinney was a panelist on our Climate Change Theater Action event in the fall this year, where she explained a little of her research regarding how we live upon this earth together and particularly her focus on the management of fresh water. She also raised very eloquent questions regarding the kinds of imaginaries that have gone into industrial developments and the commodification of water and the corollary between those imaginaries and then the loss of the imaginaries that understand the deep interconnection of all beings and, and how human survival is inextricably connected to this. So there's great connections I see already between your work. So I'm so happy to invite to, to welcome Makere back here today. Our second respondent is Yelena Glusman, um, who is a uh, new professor at U of A who came in the summer of 2021 to take up her position in the Faculty of Arts from the University of California in San Diego, where she completed her PhD. She's an experimental theater director and filmmaker and works across disciplines of cognitive science, interaction studies, critical disability studies, and feminist science and technology studies. Um, she, now, she now makes her home here at U of A, cross-posted between art and design, science, technology, and society program, and media and technology studies. 
Uh, Yelena makes connections between theater rehearsal practices of improvisation and the scientific method, which is also an open process of the exploration of hypotheses. She has a background in brain science and holds an MFA in directing from Columbia. And in a recent chapter in the Rutledge Companion to Performance Philosophy, Yelena and her co-author discuss theater as if theory and demonstrate how to think about theater and theory through each other and discuss a conference they've organized based on the premise that performance is not solely an artistic medium, but also a vast complex conceptual philosophic structure. They call it an uncanny social science, a way of researching human experience by being it a way of theorizing about the meaning making, the physical world, political and intuitional constructs by causing and simultaneously being caused by them. These ideas are very relevant to the work Teresa has shared with us today. And I'm so happy to welcome you to this conversation, Yelena, and look forward to getting to know more about your work in the drama department. And then finally, our third respondent will be Jean O'Hara, who holds a PhD in theater and performance studies at York University from York University. And joined us, they joined us in the fall here in 2019 in drama. She's a director, divisor, dramaturg, and clown. Jean has trained at the Manitoulin Conservatory for Creation and Performance. The San Francisco Mime Troupe has taken a class in African theater with Femi Osofius' son and the Tectonic Theater Project. He's also studied and applied at Augusto Boal's Theater of the Oppressed, both in the community and on stage and in the classroom. Their research is centered on two-spirit LGBTQ plus theater and performance and social justice theater. And they edited Two-Spirit Acts, Indigenous Queer Performances published in 2013. And it was the first collection of its kind in Canada. And I'm also particularly happy to welcome Jean as a respondent today because of their work as a co-director and divisor with Salmon is Everything. Um, and that is my introduction to the respondent. So I think we'll, we'll start with Mekere and I think we'll spotlight you, Teresa, and Mekere, and have you at the, at the center of our screens so we can uh, enjoy your conversation. Tina Koto Kia Koto. Tamia nui he mihi ki iu matanaro, ki papatunaku i takutune, ki tangaroa i tune, uh, nā rira ki a koutou katoa tine te mihi whānui ki a koutou. Um, Tamia tuarua he mihi hoki ki ngā tangata whenua ko a whetu rangi i te rā nei e, uh, ki ngā tangata whenua um, ora Kua koutou, uh, tēnā koutou, kia koutou. Um, I, uh, in, in just um, acknowledging first um, Tapatuanuku and um, Ranginui Tune, and in acknowledging the people of this land and those who have gone before, I'm bringing together um, the very bare bones of a genealogy of interweaving and interconnection. And I want to, um, in particular, uh, acknowledge that um, coming from Aotearoa, New Zealand, as I do, member of the Waitaha Iwi or the Waitaha tribe, it's been my privilege to live here on this land in Treaty 6, a land that has been inhabited by so many people in a land too on which I was once taken out to the mountains and there I saw a bridge in the heavens that connected that sacred spot to a sacred spot in our mountains at home and I recognized why my relations had told me of this connection before I came here and so I want to just um, acknowledge that right now I feel very emotional about all of that as I've listened to you, Teresa, and as I've um, reflected on those things. And so there's been much um, in, your, in your speaking that has been deeply moving, and I'm grateful to have been invited to come and listen and respond um, to you. Uh, and thank you, Selena, for that invitation. 
And I barely know where to start, except um, perhaps I want to start with um, the role of the breath and the role of story. And there's a story that, you know, that I, that I came across. There was a, a play um, being put on in Aotearoa, New Zealand, where I come from, in Auckland, in fact, some years ago, and it was about a river. It was about what we would call a stream, really, a stream that was not remarkable and that had a lot of um, paru, a lot of algae, a lot of um, ill treatment and, you know, was filled with rubbish. And in the interview um, with the playwright, he was asked why he had decided to take up the story of the river, Maori, and um, he said very emphatically, I did not take up the cause of the river. And the interviewer said, well, but, but you did. He said, I, I did not take up the cause of the river. He said, this was about kaitiakitanga. And kaitiakitanga is, as he explained, this moral responsibility that we have as the junior, most junior creatures in creation to take care of all of our whanaunga, of all of our relations. And, and so I reflected on that and, and what that speaks to in terms of relationality and in terms of who the polar bear is and on, in terms of how and what we take up or don't take up or why we take it up. And I, you know, I, w I was thinking also about, I think it was Barad who talks about the fact that there is no separation between skin and kin because together we co-constitute reality. Together we, we are so entwined. And so, what does that mean? I was thinking too about the power of breath as you spoke, the power of the spoken word, but also um, how breath and voice brings into being, which is truly what you were talking about, yes? And in our old teachings of my of Waitaha, and shared by many. Um, it was told that it was in the night when the gods sang the world into being. And one of my own preoccupations forever has been how do we re-sing the world? With what voice do we re-sing the world? And that's what I was listening to as I listened to your stories, Teresa, about um, plays and, and drama and what we give voice to and how we um, seek to bring into being. So in that, one of my great preoccupations is that very thing in this time, in this time in which truly we are not on the brink of, but we are well and truly inside um, massive climate change and massive loss and all of those things. Apocalypse or otherwise, as, as Kyle says, and yes, we've had them before. I am struck again as you articulated with what is, what is the world? What is it that we are seeking to bring into being? And if ever there was a time to think really, really deeply about that, it is surely, surely now. And as I think about that relationship between the human and what we sometimes call the non-human or what many of us prefer to call the more than human, um, and the possibilities that lie before us and the contestation, if you like, about what that shape will be. 
as new technologies emerge, as new industries emerge that seek to extract in different ways. What then is the what then is the role and place of indigenous ontologies of being and what do they tell us? What then is the nature of being human? Or again, what then is the nature of being? And so I'm reflecting on your wonderful image of that um, bear that mobile, dynamic, changing bear. I'm reflecting on what it is that was tried to be portrayed. How do we reflect that intertwining of, of being? How, is, how do we step away from seeing the bear in the river is done to, or is done about to recognize how deeply intertwined we are in that making and unmaking and changing and constantly changing. And so I'm reflecting also about this question of climate change and resilience and the nature of resilience as we go forward because resilience is one of those charged words right which has so many meanings Ooh. the power of voice with every sound we utter and extraction and extractiveness There's a story that I sometimes tell, it's not a story per se, um, and, I, and I'm not even sure if it's relevant right now, but thinking about how we speak and who we speak and what we speak and what that all means. And, and I think about this quite often when I'm talking about um, developing research essays and how you do academic writing or you don't do academic writing. So when I was teaching at home in the Whariwānanga or Awanui Arangi, we had a, a, a wonderful um, colleague there who was also doing his master's degree. And one of my fellow um, lecturers was talking with me one day about if only he would learn to write academically. And there's meaning, I think, in, in, in what I want to say here because the difference was, and we had this discussion, what does it mean to tell a story or what does it mean to write, write academically? And so Māori orators, as, like, as with many indigenous orators and storytellers, have a different way of talking about these things. And, and so when I listened to this particular colleague come student or read his work as I read his essays, I listened as I read them. I listened to I listened to his writing as if he was speaking on our marae or on our places of meeting because he would begin out there and weave together all the elements of what this was that he was bringing into being And in that weaving, he wove together all the elements that you would ever want to see in an academic piece of writing, if that was what you were certainly looking for. But more than that, he had a, we a way of weaving together in his writing, with his voice, all those elements of being that come together to make or represent whatever it is that we are doing. And so where does that take me? I'm thinking back to that question of how do we sing the world into being or re-sing the world into being. And I'm thinking about Māori and indigenous genealogies of being in which we are part of an enormously complex 
web of interconnection that we are never separate from, but we have become so separate from. And I think as I listen to your plays and your discussion, Teresa, that is what I'm being reminded of, is how we need to bring ourselves back into that relationship how we recover from that enormous rupture that has almost become part and parcel of who human beings are today. And um, you've given me a great deal to think about in, in these representations. Um, but you've most of all have reminded me of the urgency of our work and using voice and I'm a little stuck with the river because I come from water people, Waitaha means carriers of the water and the particular river that I come from is now the site of seven, um, seven dams, it's the site of monumental production of hydropower mm. and of course, we are a country in Aotearoa, New Zealand, of many rivers, and many of them are braided wild rivers and desecrated by dairy development and hydropower together. And so the power then of those stories and, and performances that somehow, somehow speak to not the being done to so much as the what we collectively are creating with ourselves. So thank you. Ah, thank you. I forgot to watch myself. Thanks. Well, that's okay, Mercury. That was beautiful. I think what I'd like to do now is just add Yelena into the conversation and Jean as well, and we can have sort of build on each other if that's all right with you. So I'm going to I'll spotlight. Yelena here, so she's now come in as well. Hello. Hello, I'm so happy to be here. And um, Makere, that was, yeah, I, I love your focus on um, with what voice do we sing the world? That's such a beautiful taking up of Teresa's question. And Teresa, your talk was really amazing. And um, I feel like um, I learned a lot, of course, and um, just, um, there, especially certain moments, um, uh, the, the details, you know, um, the words, um, the stories that you're telling are vivid and um, give a sort of, yeah, I, anyway, I, I'm really appreciative. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, so, um, and for my own, you know, positionality and perspective in respect to this is, um, you know, as, um, Selena, uh, beautifully, thank you so much for the introduction to and for reading, you know, theater as a theory. That's um, so nice of you. <laughs> and um, um, but yeah, so as an ex, you know, I, I come from experimental theater, um, and um, I would really describe myself as an experimentalist. You know, so my background as a as a teenager was in the lab and in science, and that and that really formed my attention. Mm -hmm to uh, the way in which things happen, you know, to the, to the actual happenings of things. So um, I'm constantly sort of going back to considering um, the sorts of ideologies and um, um, narratives by which we're supposed to understand the world by actually understanding them, you know, by attending to the way in which we do those narratives and the way in which we uh, engage each other in um, challenging those kinds of narratives or ideologies or extending them or whatever. So, um, and as Selena said, you know, my path has taken me kind of um, through experimental theater into uh, science and technology studies. So, so for those of you, you know, in the, in the Zoom room who don't know that field, science and technology studies is really like a humanistic interpretive approach to thinking about the interrelationships between um, society and science, technology, 
uh, environmental studies, medicine, et cetera. So um, in, even in my own engagement in that, you know, I kind of hold a place <laughs> and it's an awkward, weird place, you know, between the sorts of languages and attentions um, that people um, have to be answerable to in the sciences and the kinds of attentions and responsibilities that people are answerable to in a project like a theater project, you know, which as I think you beautifully say is a world making project, which I really could not agree with you more. And I loved how you talked about that. Um, uh, and, and drew on indigenous playwrights in their talking about it. That was so valuable that you had their words um, present. So, and also now I can follow some of those threads. So I'm, I'm really grateful for that. So I guess um, uh, I, um, I'd like to basically just ask two questions. Um, and hopefully I don't wanna talk for too long because I'd like to give you time to, um, to respond because I kind of wanna know more here. So one question really comes out of my engagement as an experimental theater maker myself and someone who's very much involved in um, thinking through practice, like how do we deal with these ideas in practice? And for me, one of the um, most interesting parts of that and I don't know, maybe this is my own background, um, um, but um, is like, where do things break down? You know, so looking at exactly the places where, you know, so I really appreciated the part in your talk where you talked about the problem of staging the bear, you know, and all of the choices that you had to reject, you know, as, as no, we can't do that because of what it means. And, and you had to go back and think, well, what is the bear in this, um, in this world, in this ecology of the play. So I kind of want to press against that because, and this is, so maybe this is not only a question for you, Teresa, but also for Jean, in the sense that you've worked together in staging um, the last production that you talked about. But um, um, I'm interested in um, your processes of rehearsal and uh, production building. And um, I'm interested in what were the obstacles there? So in your commitment to indigenous methodologies of um, creating theater, of performance, um, you know, where were those obstacles? Where were those resistances? Whether they came from the institutional spaces, the relationships in working, you know, time, whatever. Um, you know, both not, you know, we tend to tell success stories because we're sort of expected to show up with an insight. And, um, but I'm curious, not all, you know, both the obstacles that were, that did end up being productive, like the obstacle of how to stage the bear, uh, but maybe the obstacles that are not yet productive, you know, but that may be productive in the room and in our conversation. Um, so that is one question. And, and I think, that it really relates to, um, I now forget um, who you were quoting, but this idea that scholarship is not enough, right? It's the theoretical engagement is not enough. The research is not enough because why the reason that we're all here is to understand how to live because the understanding of how to live is itself an embedded practical process where we're constantly um, in encountering obstacles. So that's the first question. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Um, my second question, I guess, comes more from thinking through STS, science and technology studies. Like I said, I'm sort of have this weird position in between these worlds. Um, and um, in um, science and technology society studies that consider that, that center um, the environmental crisis, um, and in and that shares an interest in uncovering those kinds of like as you talked about at the beginning, uh, in uncovering the like implicit assumptions about land, property, um, and the relation of humans to um, other than human or more than human stakeholders. You know, <laughs> as often gets cast in the economic language of of um, of science and technology. Um, in STS, there's been interest lately, so there's been this kind of discourse that's emerged lately about the notion of the commons and taking up this idea of the commons as a different kind of model or um, um, ideology or assumption about those kinds of relations. Um, we're humans, so in, the, in this idea about the commons, humans are understood as caretakers, 
outside of individual private ownership. Um, and, um, you know, uh, in the sense of becoming one another's keepers, uh, also a phrase you used, um, but this idea of a keepership of the land of a shared environment as opposed to a, a property or ownership of the land. And I'm wondering, so I recognize that that <laughs> notion of the commons itself comes out of a history and out of um, a sort of European colonial history. And so I'm wondering if there is, if you find any affinity in that notion of the commons um, or a way to sort of challenge even to poke back at this idea of the commons as, um, as a not enough uh, from the perspective of uh, indigenous allyship and um, like world building through collaboration. So that would be my second question. Great question. Do you wanna go first, Teresa? Oh, well, it's up to Selena. Didn't you want to, did you want to get all the questions in there? Or do you want me to? You feel like, do you, can, is that okay? Can you, can you add more on or do you want to stop and respond a bit? No, I, I can wait. I, I would invite everyone, since this is being recorded, you know, to, if you do have questions in light of time, to throw them into the chat, then that way they'll be part of the recording. And then those of you who come on Monday, we can even throw around some of those questions at that time too, but um, mm -hmm. sure, I'm happy to get all the questions on the table because of course they speak to each other, right? So, so Selena, you're asking me to give the questions too in addition to answering these other ones later. Okay, great, just want to be clear. I think what comes up for me, of course, is um, how, how do we be changed as, as directors, as people co-creating and writing these pieces? How are we changed? Um, something that's really important to me and certainly in my experience. Um, and then I, I think one of the things I'm looking at when we're looking at climate change and all these issues around um, the harm to the to the earth <laughs> and the peoples, uh, original peoples who were, you know, been on this land and have a deep, deep relationship. I'm, I, we, I think we sometimes go, oh, we, we talk about white supremacy, but we don't talk about male supremacy. And I think that's something I've been chewing on lately as someone who thinks about gender and so forth and beyond, but also because that becomes, uh, is taken out, right? <laughs> and it's interesting that we have all these female body people talking about this, right? And in this play, like even, and, and some of that male, uh, Power um, and cis white male it just definitely came into the, the to the to the production right of salmon is everything, uh, but it's but it's there right the uranium and all, you know, all that stuff is this is men taking it out right uh, white men so I really want this erasure of naming that right that eight men of all different ethnicities own all the oil right <laughs> of the world right and they're making the decision right. And so, so there's, I'm, I have, those are my mm, things I'm thinking of right now, right? Or have been thinking about, and how do I write about this and think about this and how do I do theater that makes that uh, um, present, right? Um, so those are my thoughts. Um, I just, I think it was quite a, it's been quite a journey with Sam is Everything, Nevermind, um, all these other pieces and I've certainly, uh, yeah. Um, Marie Clement's work is profound, and I think she's probably the most brilliant playwright. <laughs> um, so, so I really am grateful um, for her work, and I just want to name that too. So, those I, I have more questions, but those are the two things uh, on my mind and in my heart. Wonderful, thank you, Jean. Um, so, Teresa, and maybe I'll just add all of our respondents here. And, and we also had the invitation to open the chat and have, if you'd like to, people listening would like to add something. We may not get to your question now, but we'll definitely record them and they'll be available uh, for further thinking. Um, so, okay. um, So I'll respond to the responses. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, Macaray, is that how I'm saying your name? Exactly. Yeah. So beautiful to 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 your uh, stream of thought and to your resonance. Um, just really touching. And I got this sorry back to gallery because I don't want to look at myself. <laughs> All of you. Um, 
And yeah, really, really touched by, by the who you are that comes through your voice and your presence. So I just, um, I just want to honor that and say what a gift, what a gift it is. And also I was, I was thinking about you were identifying, you know, there's, there's academic writing and then there's writing that is human and humane and 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 stories and relationships and um and i in the everyone who comes on monday will have access before that time to uh, some documents that i sent selena one of which is an article that i co-wrote with uh, the native elder that i work with um where we really tried, it was for an academic journal, but we were really trying to speak as ourselves, to speak into the relationship that we had versus one of the other articles that I sent, which is more, you know, sort of the academic, I will justify my thesis now. Um, and I, especially as I get later in my career, I am so not interested in that academic conversation just to be frank, and I am so very interested in the stories that we have to tell each other um, and the way those stories move like currents in a stream. Um, and I was struck in while you were talking, I was like, you know, because I've struggled a lot and with graduate students of mine, particularly, um, you know, graduate students of color who are wanting to write from their own lived experience as a place of authority and what that means uh, in a, a milieu that asks them to depersonalize their work and how to help them assert that within the academy. But it's also thinking about, about um, academic listening. And this is really profound for me we listen differently in the theater than we do at conference. And that makes all the difference. Right? At a conference, we're actually listening for myself, but there's a way in which listening and even reading, you know, you're re reading, graduate students are reading, you know, for the seminar that's tomorrow. We read and we listen extractively. Yes. Yeah. First line, last line, what's the thesis? What's the argument? Where's the unit? You know, and that, that there's a whole different kind of listening when we're invited to listen to somebody's stories. And so you, re, you reminded me, you helped me make that distinction. Um, so I, I, really, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna try and call myself out when I'm listening extractively versus when I'm listening uh, holistically or, or relationally. Um, so, um, Yelena, right? Is that, am I saying your name correctly? Yeah, you can say it however you like. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, yeah, I love the question. What were the obstacles? What were the failures? What were the pitfalls? In um, this uh, book, of Where Salmon is Everything is Published, is a chapter there's a chapter by Jean as well, but um, I have a chapter and my chapter goes pitfall to pitfall to pitfall to pitfall. It's like every single thing that I stepped in as a white settler person, what, you know, the whole project proceeded that way. And, and that's what we have to be willing, you know, we have to, we have to be willing. I have to be willing, you know, my life, Jean asked the question, how has I changed? My life and the trajectory of my life, trajectory of my research was completely altered. Walking into my native colleague's office and saying, hey, were you a play? <laughs> how naive was that, right? I did not realize that my, I would be undone, that I would necessarily be undone by that. So I write about all those moments of learning um, and the thing, you know, that so much of our training wants to prevent us from learning that way, from learning in relationship, from learning learn to walk. I also teach movement, movement, and we learn to walk by falling. 
So I think we learn to be, to decolonize ourselves by running smack into the thing in our head, the thing in the room, um, being told, I mean, anyway, <laughs> that chapter tells a lot of these stories. I don't want to take a long time telling them. But there was a moment you'd also talked about rehearsal because we were, we're in rehearsal with this play. And as the primary um, dramatist, I'm writing and rewriting, rewriting according to the, the native um, indigenous um, actors that I'm working with, uh, many of whom had no acting training, but they would just say, no, Teresa, that's not how, that's not how she would say it. And so just a couple of examples. One was uh, Kathy McCove, a uh, Karuk elder, had shared with us this gorgeous brush dance skirt that she had made for ceremony, told us that story, given us permission to have that story and the skirt itself to be part of the play. And so two examples around that. This is a piece of material culture now. It's not a costume. It's not a prop. And so how to explain that distinction to a production team you know, that's not part of that part. That was the sort of institutional thing. But meanwhile, in rehearsal, you know, I said, well, okay, so when uh, Rose, the grandmother, um, invites um, this skirt to be, be shared or be seen, um, is it, maybe we could have it upstage, like in a basket or something. And um, now the Karuk are very famous basket makers, right? So it's not like I'm saying this out of complete ignorance, <laughs> but I said, we could have the skirt upstage in a basket and then go get the basket and, you know, come down. So I'm trying to be director and, and, uh, and all the Kathy just looks at me and says, uh, a basket? Like, we don't keep our, I don't keep my skirt in a basket. And I said, oh, okay, well, like, where do you keep it? And she says, I keep it in a roller, in a roller suitcase so I can throw it in the back of my truck when I go to powwow, <laughs> when I go to ceremony. And so that was a, like, you know, it was the part of my brain that was the settler part that had, you know, sort of romanticized this skirt. And then Kathy's like, no, I keep it in, you know, solid piece of luggage because I'm going <laughs> to... And so, and so that was a moment. So we rewrote that dialogue and the, and the elder, the grandmother says something else. There was another moment with that same skirt, which is a sacred object and a piece of material culture. It is alive, it dances. I did not know that at the time. So there are two characters in the play, um, uh, I'm forgetting their names right now, Kate and Rachel, they are uh, partners. Um, so that actually goes a little bit to Jean's question about, you know, there's a, um, a, a queer couple in the play and there, there was a lot of conversation around that, but they're in there for a reason. This is a family. This is a, this is just to assert the presence. Um, so, so they're visiting the elder and the, and, and the elder wants to share the brush dance skirt and tell them the story of the skirt. And and so it comes and now it's not in a basket, it's in a suitcase and they bring it out. And we're trying to figure out the blocking of how is this skirt then shared with these two non-native women. And so one of the actresses reaches out, one of the non-native actresses to take the skirt and to hold it up to herself, just like you would if you were with girlfriends at a, in a room and you were just like, oh, that's cool, look. And the native women went, whoa, stop don't touch it. And so we all just came full stop. And I was like, okay, talk to me. What? And that's when I learned and I learned in the moment that this is that this skirt is alive. It can't be touched by anyone except Kathy. It's a ceremonial piece of material culture. And, and so then that, you know, I wrote about that in the book too. And then we changed that you know, we worked out something else in terms of the staging. So those are just two small examples, but, you know, yes, that's, in, and that's, you can't sort of not have those things happen. They're welcome and they're wonderful and they're, 
they're embarrassing and they make you grow. And um, I've been so moved by the open heartedness and the generosity of the people with whom I've collaborated. Um, so uh, the commons, I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not, although, you know, obviously, although Leopard, Leopold and, and others in the theorizing of the commons, but I think, I don't know, I could just imagine myself talking to one of my indigenous colleagues or students about the commons, and they're like the commons. That's sort of like finding common ground. The problem with finding common ground is it's always like the majority group's commonness. Mm -hmm. So they would say, why, why do we have to call it the commons when you took it from us? It's our land, right? What, what, you know, so the, the word itself is kind of hollow for me until we, until we make reparations or until we admit at least um, the discourse it comes out of. Um, so, but I know there's a whole, you know, wonderful set of articulated values around the commons and that kind of thing. Um, I believe it in, on it in it in small scale in the sense of like the neighborhood. Here's a shed where we don't have to have six lawnmowers. We can only have one. We have one, and you can borrow it because it's our common yard tools. <laughs> so that kind of thing. Um, Okay, two minutes, oh my gosh. Yeah, that, that's wonderful. And I just wanna say that um, I love in your response, um, your own story of being undone, as you put it, when you walked into your colleague's office and said, let's do a play. Um, that really very much resonates with my own experience of being undone uh, the first time I had to direct a play, which was totally random and I had no experience doing that. And a friend asked me, but it, it's a long story, but um, your use of the word undone, I think, is really wonderful and I think relates to this conversation um, between you and Makete about um, uh, the academic article, right? And, and having to, you know, having that base kind of swept away and then finding yourself in this incredibly vulnerable um, place, which is also incredibly exciting. And that place is the place of making, it's the place of world making. It's totally relational. So there, you know, all of this preparation that that perhaps you are imbued with through schooling and through reasons and you know reason and logic uh, are indeed undone. Um, so I, I really appreciate your your choice of those words. That's great. Thank you so much. And and of course, redone and remade. I mean, over and over. Yeah. Yeah. Which is how the bear, you know, was actually performed. You know, they didn't rehearse it so that they knew, okay, now the next move, you know, I'm doing this and you're doing that. It was random each and every moment of each and every performance. Exactly what you're saying, yeah. Great. Oh, um, I answer, or oh, I'm sorry. I don't know if we, I'm not clear what the order is and what, where we're yeah. at, sorry. Go ahead, Jill, whatever you wanna say. Oh, I just wanted to just speak to those those questions, the same same two questions around um, the challenges or fail like failures and so forth. Um, yeah, I guess I, there's two things. Well, there's multiple things that come up in my mind, but I know that I came into salmon is everything concerned about the salmon and not really understanding what that meant to the Kuruk, Iraq, and Hupa peoples, right? And um, how that was not only a main food source, actually the first food you give to your baby is salmon, right? And those communities, but also connected to ceremony and beyond, right? And so um, I came from this kind of, yeah, background of teaching environmental education. You know? So, so it was a, it's very different. And I still think of the one of the wording, right? Because this was a, this was a quite a long process, right? Um, Teresa put in and I jumped in in different ways um, until we got to the actual play, but it was getting the writing from different indigenous folks. And then those who were not indigenous were also writing, right? About these other parts of the river people. And so one of the things I love is that salmon knows more than I know. 
And that's not something I was raised with as someone who was forced into Christianity. Um, there's this hierarchical, you know, where the human is the highest, right? And, and the human male, right? Where like even females come from his rib, which is kind of hilarious. Um, <laughs> and so, so yeah, so there was this hierarchical and I was like, how can Sam know more than I know, right? Like there was this questioning um, and yet uh, it was so beautiful to hear some of the, the ways uh, these because we were working with ind multiple different indigenous nations right it wasn't just one and you know I mean, it wasn't all within what's now called northern california so so this is what you do you need actors right? you need you need indigenous actors or non-actors but who are willing to get on stage right so that was also it like how do you know Kathy was incredibly nervous every time she was up there and she would write her lines on her hand I mean just like the courage uh, that we were asking for her uh, people to do and, and something so personal and so painful right um, but for her it was so important to show up because this is how uh, we heal you know in part but also um, that practicing she's she was not a theater person none of I don't think any of the indigenous folks were actual theater person but wanted but everyone's a storyteller right but in this form that we do on a stage um, but later on, when we we're getting, they were getting into political action, and now the dams are going to be coming down, hopefully, four dams, the biggest dam removal in the United States, um, will be next year, uh, that, that that was a practice for her. And she said, I realized how that was helping me, like, to speak up and speak out, um, even if there's a thousands and thousands of people looking at me at the shareholders meeting, and I'm, I'm, I'm questioning the, those who own it, right? Um, own the rivers that they live on. Um, so yeah, so so my I think the challenge was, uh, well, first of all, yeah, yeah, I guess a willingness to be changed, and that's and 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 being taught uh, a history that isn't written down anywhere, right? Um, and we we had like a, a dinner afterwards together in my apartment, um, talking about the journey, you know, too, um, and so much was so much was shared but doing it um when i what i was a sessional or a lecturer you know going to the three reservations and had no little to no money <laughs> no backup from the department chair you know like um as teresa was a you know a professor right so there was not that there was a lot given but there was something given so there were we didn't have tech people we didn't have little to nothing and so so doing that process and trying to get to each reservation and um, <laughs> was a huge project just in general and one of the things I got from that too was like yeah so we had to spend a lot of time because the stages were different sometimes we weren't even on stage and you name it keys weren't there um, life happens um, but one of the things that came back is one of the elders who who couldn't come because it's about a two hour drive to get to all the way back to the ocean world where Humboldt State is, um, that, that they didn't want to see the pictures of the dead salmon, that that was something they did not want to see and that was harmful. Um, and that was, this, you know, even though we did have indigenous people obviously come um, to, for the full production the first time we did it that first year and the second year, that 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 that's not how they want to remember them but that's not how they want to see they don't want to see that kind of um, incredible corpses of these people they love of these beings they love um, so there was so there's a constant learning and um and building relationships that i it was you know as a person who's white there's every i look like the colonizer i have you know benefited from colonization right um in ways, right? And so there was this, like some people, it took two years. And one of them was that when I was, you know, going to the reservations where it's like, okay, now I know you're gonna keep showing up. Now I know you understand or that kind of way of relation. So I think that's a, a sense of humility is important in the process. Um, yeah. And then I guess the, the last piece that I think of, which was a challenge was, you know, Teresa and I were co-directing, which is also not an easy process. But then we had this um, cis white guy who basically started directing other people, <laughs> and it, but never had directed. I don't remember who that was. 
<laughs> oh, what's his face? I can't remember his name. Okay, he went we'll to talk later. <laughs> yeah. So it was, you know, just again, there, there are these ways of um, anyway, what and I say one of the strengths were uh that we both were divisors, uh, Teresa and I, and, and movers and dancers and all and, and improvers, and that we really we're constantly co-creating and humor was a really big piece of what I brought in for sure <laughs> um, because I I know that that's really important um, too and to, so we would do warm-ups that were just ridiculous half the time but yeah it was um it was a lot of learning on, on everyone's end um, and a lot of graciousness and kindness and uh yeah, and forever changed, you know, all of us, all of us, um, but, but definitely Teresa and I, for sure, yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. I, I, uh, I did say that I dropped in the chat, we were gonna stay a little bit longer. There are a couple of questions. Um, we may not be able to get to them. Uh, one was uh, uh, thinking about um, theater uh, departments and what changes might need to be made to make uh, to nurture ecological dramatic practice, eco dramaturgical praxis. I guess this is directed to you, Teresa, if you have thoughts on you know, theater companies, theater departments. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I want to make sure and, and um, say a couple things because I know some people may, who are coming on Monday, might need to leave since we're a little over time. Mm -hmm. Once think I want you to bring sort of two things. One is take a look at those green questions to ask a play or just your thoughts from today and identify a play that you think might benefit from the, this, this lens or unpacking in this, in this way as those questions and to share about that. And then the other thing is to bring um, a, a project. I mean, it doesn't have to be a project like write a play or develop a play, but something that you're up to in your life and your career that you would just like to have the time to talk about with folks um, with some common ground. So we'll completely use Monday as a workshop for you, for what serves you. And I'll do a, a little devising exercise too that, that will be interesting or fun, I hope. Um, but, but bring what you wanna work on, so. Um, I want to just loop back a little bit to what Jean said and what she what they asked about um, uh, you know male male supremacy because just absolutely I mean that's that's the ideology in those early plays that is being enforced upon the land. Um, there's also so much rhetoric and so much imaginary and envisaging of the land as feminine and agency as male you know, from building the dam to, there's actually some verbiage in a, a, a book I read that was written in the 1920s by someone, um, you know, working for the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, trying to map where some of the dams in the West should be, describing this great canyon where this river flows as just waiting for men of agency to come and build a dam. So I think, you know, the gendering of the land goes really deep and it's part of what sustains extractive capitalism today. And I think as women um, and women identified people, uh, we understand how it extracts from us too. Um, so yes, part and parcel, I, maybe I should have said, you know, hetero, um, male uh, logocentric white supremacy um, as, it, as it is expressed through ecological ideology of those periods and ongoingly. Um, and that's why Kate and Rachel are in the play. And that's why, you know, um, one of Linda Tehiwe Smith's um, indigenizing projects is just tell the story from a woman's point of view. And that's what these two playwrights um, have done and um, there's power in that, you know, take the story back, tell the different story. Certainly Raisin in the Sun does that, you know, even though there's a, a strong crazy male at the center of the story um, uh, and he would be called the protagonist, um, you know, the women in that play 
are what make it a play about environmental justice. So, um, yeah, and of course that, that hierarchy is rampant in the academy too, but never mind that. So speaking of the academy, um, the question about departments, I think, you know, I don't know, I'm probably not a good person to ask that question because I have struggled and continue to struggle. So find your allies, work across, work outside your department, you know, work with environmental studies, work with science and technology folks, work with people in the Department of Education, um, work with people in indigenous studies, get those allies um, on, you know, be on their team and, and, and have them uh, understand what you're up to in your department in terms of producing or in terms of teaching from these points of view, um, both you know, ecological and, and, and social justice points of view. So um, that would be, and, and you know, do it and teach it um, and document it. The more you document it, the more it will be there when you need to point to it um, when the hierarchy says, uh, ask you to prove that you're worthy of staying in the hierarchy. <laughs> I'm, I apologize. I'm getting a little giddy <laughs> because I don't think there's any woman in, in the academy now uh, who doesn't have a sense of how deeply, deeply the academy is rooted in the patriarchy of the Catholic Church going way back. And, you know, we just have to keep standing up. Teach what you want, teach what you believe in, direct, produce, write what you want. So you can point to it and get allies outside your department. Theater especially, very, very, uh, very patriarchal, very hierarchical. Uh, so all the more through devising and collaboration you can break those barriers down. Uh, it's, a, it's a great answer, Teresa, actually. And I, I think actually this, this amazing session we've had today speaks, I think, to that, that uh, what you've just said, uh, to find allies across places and, to, and to, uh, to be determined to do your work and to document it. And I just, I can't thank you enough for coming and sharing all of this with us today. And I can't wait that we have another, another uh, session with you on Monday, a smaller session with people who've signed up to do the workshop. There will, we will uh, email those workshop participants the, the links to the documents that Teresa has mentioned. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and look forward to actually try to, trying to dig in, as, you, as you've said in, this, in this, uh, this talk, as you opened so, so eloquently with like the, what is an eco-dramaturgical lens bring to an understanding of the history that is still present? And yet, what can't it do, and what 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 must we also do? And I hope that on 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 the workshop on Monday we can really come to that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I look forward to it. I put my email in the chat, whether you're on Monday or not, or you know, reach out if there's something to reach out about, right. or even if there's not, just say hi. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, I'm I'm certainly available for for conversations, and uh, so so honored to be here today. And by all of your questions, uh, and Marie and Yelena and Selena, uh, thank you and thank you everyone for for being here. Right. Thanks. Thanks so much. All right. So we'll call it an end here. Um, thank you to all. The